Then the great demonstrations began in 1960, and we represented the movement. We represented uh, Dr. King, we represented the poor, and in its early days, uh, we began representing SNCC. And uh, then dozens of ad hoc community groups, the Albany movement, the Jackson movement, and uh, uh, the Nashville movement, and so forth. And uh, we brought the lawsuit that permitted Martin King to march in Selma. Uh, and we uh, represented Dr. King in Birmingham. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, there, the movement brought about 40 cases to the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, we represented them in virtually all of those cases, and I think we won them all except one. The Defense Fund was founded in 1939, uh, and uh, it had a small staff then of just two or three lawyers, and it was headed by Thurgood Marshall. And then our job was uh, solely to make precedent. We weren't big enough to do very much along the line of enforcement. Uh, and we started in with uh, the cases to integrate the universities. And when I came to work here in 1949, we had before the Supreme Court of the United States the cases uh, which were um, aimed at integrating the University of Texas and the University of Oklahoma. Uh, then followed the school segregation cases, Brown against Board of Education, and that, of course, was the great landmark case, one of the great cases, you might even say perhaps the greatest case, decided by the Supreme Court of the United States. Well, the Legal Defense uh, Fund had initiated a suit here to uh, desegregate the public schools in Orleans Parish. Uh, Mr. Bush was one of those uh, who joined in with a number of parents to protest to the school board the inadequacy of the school facilities. We came to the conclusion that uh, just asking for additional school facilities was not an answer to the problem that the uh, Negro children in New Orleans were facing, so we filed this suit to desegregate the schools in the system. It's been 14 years since the uh, suit was filed and the case was decided. And up until now, there's very little integration in the uh, all in Paris school system. It is a little better, I'll admit that. Mr. Bush, uh, we started this case in 1952. In 1960, the first four Negro children desegregated the public school system of New Orleans. At that time, did any of your children go into the public school uh, oh, no. desegregation program? Not one, not one. Uh, have any of them uh, gone into desegregated schools since 1960? No, not one. In other words, all of your children have attended Negro schools. That's right. Also, there was a case against the city of New Orleans to require them to employ a Negro policemen. Is that yes, right? Yes, we did that around 1947. While a student at Dillard University, I took the police examination along with several other friends. Uh, I passed in the higher nineties, and all of the men who took the examination at the time I took it made reasonably good scores. However, we were passed over for appointments, actual appointments. On the occasion of the second Passover, I alerted your office, and when my name was passed over for the third time, I requested assistance from the Legal Defense Fund. This brought your office into the case, and we were successful, of course, in eventually being appointed. June 16, 1950, two of us were appointed to become the first Negroes on the police force. You in did serve on the police force? I did. In active duty? For a period of five years. I think the PQ case in general opened up uh, jobs for more Negroes. Uh, since that case, they had this number of policemen hired. Uh, at present, they have about five Negro women working in communication. They have uh, one Negro woman in the uh, central lockup, and there are quite a few Negro sheriffs uh, before there were none. The case became moot because we were actually assigned, the case was to come up on the 20th and we were appointed on the 16th. Yes. The pressure 
generated by the case really made the actual arguing of the case in court unnecessary. The main problem was that I used to ride number six bus. And uh, you get on number six, you pay your money, and if one white person sit on the seat, you make your women and children, all Negroes sit in the back. You get out and transfer and cap the street. You give your money in the front door and you run in the back door. Now that was the reason that I brought the suit on this thing. I just couldn't stand to give my money through the front door and, and pay as much as the white, and then run in the back door. Yeah. And that's when I contacted you, because then you contact the legal defense for them. Yeah. And uh, we got the suit started. You and others have indicated to me many times that you felt that maybe the best route for you would be through the courts rather than maybe uh, in the streets or something like that. And you never did actually participate so far as uh, any violence or anything like that to uh, accomplish your objective. And, and I assume that's the reason why you contacted legal defense for going at it in the proper way. Yeah, that's true that's uh, in, that, in the case because you cannot win with, with bricks and bottles. Yeah. You've got to go through the court procedure. After the Brown decision, our work began to change somewhat. We still continued with precedent-making cases. Uh, we brought the case that required integration of hospitals. Uh, and we brought a good number of cases under the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which upheld its constitutionality. But we had many cases that were principally involved with enforcement. Uh, we, we brought the Meredith case. We integrated the University of Alabama. In fact, there is not a southern state university system which was not sued by us to require its integration, with the exception of Arkansas. And they integrated when a lawsuit was announced, and uh, we didn't actually have to go through it things are getting worse rather than better for the majority of poor Negroes in this state. And one that wants to ask, I assume, what is the Legal Defense Fund doing in response to this? At most, I can say that our gestures are minimal, even though we're, we're trying as hard as we can. Our resources are limited, and there's great need for at least 15 or 20 Legal Defense Funds. We're spending a huge amount of our time, I think, on the community aspect of law, because I think over the years we've learned that lawyers are arguing cases in court really bring about very little change unless you can begin to deal with the problems of law and its applicability to communities and how people live. We aren't going to make very much progress. As a result, we're dealing a great deal in school desegregation because we're still faced with a Negro population with less than seven years medium education. We're beginning to start a new welfare litigation program because welfare, we find, is the central issue in the state because it means for many, many Negro citizens the difference between eating and not eating at all. And while the welfare payments in the state are woefully inadequate, even the 26% of need that the state determines that it's necessary for a family to live decently, we find that even with this inadequate provision of the welfare program of the state of Mississippi, that many of the people who are still entitled to this are not getting it because of racial discrimination or because of maladministration by welfare officials. There are many practices of the Welfare Department which are in clear violation of state and federal law, and I think we've begun last week by filing our first suit against the Welfare Department to require, under the Due Process Clause, a prior hearing before termination of welfare benefits, the first of an attack on unconstitutional, in our estimation, and un illegal welfare practices. We have purchased from the Jefferson County Board of Registrars the complete list of registered voters in the Besma Division of Jefferson County, Alabama, consisting of approximately 50,000 names. The persons sitting in front of me are using the voter list to check whatever names may be found on the jury roll. To the left of me is a blackboard where we tally each and every name. The voters list contains racial designations by number, and we are able to determine which persons are Negroes and which persons are not. We hope to prove what we think we already know, that the board who is charged with going into every beat and precinct in the area and filling the box with qualified jurors, we hope to prove that they, that, that they have not done this and that, that there are a great number of whites as opposed to a small number of Negroes Hence, the box is unconstitutionally constituted. Henry Marsh is one of our cooperating lawyers, and uh, he has brought a, a large number of cases for us, uh, including a case against the Philip Morris Corporation, uh, which, uh, before our lawsuit, uh, was uh, guilty of discrimination in employment. Nothing can be more important than the abolition 
of discrimination in employment. It determines whether a family will grow up together, or whether it will grow up in health, whether a, a child can get an education uh, and, and a higher education. We are giving all the energy we can to putting an end to racial segregation and discrimination in employment. Ms. Odenet, how long have you uh, been with the company? 29 years. And what's your job? What do you uh, do? Take the moisture. You test the moisture yes. in yes. the tobacco? Yes. Uh, how much are you paid an hour? Two twenty-one. $2.21 yeah. an hour. Uh, is anyone who works with you? This white man next to me. And do, does he do the same thing you do? Same job. And how much does he make an hour? $2.55. Two fifty five. Yes. And you, you, you both do the same thing? Same thing. And uh, you, you, you think you're entitled to be paid the same thing he's paid? Yes. Well, we'll find out when the, when the case is decided whether the court agrees with you. Or not, but uh, I think so too. I hope so. Now, are there other examples in the company of Negroes who uh, who do the same work as white employees, or work equally as hard, and yet they receive less pay? Well, uh, quite a, quite a bit of that going on on my floor now, Mr. Marsh. That's that's one reason uh, I guess I instituted the suit against the company because uh, we have Negroes on these jobs doing similar jobs to the white man, but getting less pay for them. Well, I noticed you, you sued the union. You remember we sued the union. Uh, why is it that you, that you sued the union? You feel the union is also... Well, I mean, I have went to talk to the union uh, officials several times about these jobs and elevating these jobs and so forth, but uh, uh, they didn't never give me no uh, satisfaction on they're going to do anything about the job. So otherwise, the only thing the union was doing was eating the company and, uh, and holding the Negroes' boys down keep them getting better paid jobs. Assuming that Philip Myers came, let's say, almost up to par, you know, 80% of what we are asking for. So what happens then? As you know, uh, since the suit has been filed, the company has made a vast improvement. Yeah. And uh, by the time we get to trial, they will be able to show a much better picture than they did at the time the suit was filed. Uh, this gets us into the question of whether the case is moot or not. We think, however, that the company has so far to go that they will not be able to moot the case uh, by the time the case is tried. We need a precedent very badly in this area, not just for the problem at Fuller Mars, but for many other companies all over the country, where the evidence won't be as clear as we think it is in this case. So we're going to press on for the precedent, uh, hopefully to not only help you and the 400 Negro employees at your company, but also to help the thousands of Negro employees all over the country in other companies who have been discriminated against because of their race. The, uh, one of the officials of the company testified in the depositions that uh, the Negro employees were happy and satisfied uh, with the promotion opportunities, that they, that they had no objection now. Uh, is that true? I've been trying for, for things. I have especially been in for the girls that have been really mistreated on these jobs and uh, they don't give you any satisfaction whatsoever. They tell you they're going to do something this day, and the next day they make another rule. Every day it's a new rule in Fulton Mars. Well, the company official also says, just a second, that uh, you're represented by a union. You have a union representative, and that if there's anything wrong, it's, it's, your union takes care of it. Now, is that true? Are, are you represented by a union? I have been with the company for 26 years, and I just had the opportunity of becoming an operator, and I have been question them, uh, talk with the union, and talk with the officials, as, as high as I could go up. And I still had, the first time I had this opportunity. In, in deciding to take a case, we look for what are the implications of the case? What leverage will it have? Will it interpret an important federal statute? Uh, will it uh, make a new legal precedent? Uh, sometimes a case won't make a new legal precedent, but it will make an important social precedent. Uh, a case requiring desegregation of a large industrial plant in a major city, even though it doesn't uh, make any new law, uh, will have a tremendous impact for that city if it actually brings about integration. So we look, will it be a social precedent, precedent or will it be a legal precedent? Uh, that's the kind of thing we look for. We look for the, the case that will have a big multiplier. This is the Creighton Court housing project, one of five Negro, all Negro housing projects here in the city. And the five plaintiffs in these five cases, uh, all of whom are standing on the steps over there, 
and standing out in the yard are five ladies who have had children out of wedlock. Uh, we filed suits uh, sponsored by the Legal Defense Fund challenging the right of the authority to evict these tenants on the ground that they had had children out of wedlock. Our theory being that these policies were unconstitutional and violated these 14th Amendment rights of these tenants. And they said that you are allowed one child, illegitimate child, after you move into projects. Well, I haven't had but one in projects. And I've, I've been married and I'm divorced. And um, they said that one, well, my first child by my ex-husband was illegitimate. That was, she's nine years old now. But they still count that as illegitimate. In other words, they don't make it a difference to the they way I understand that rule. Inside out, I don't think they have anything to do with your affairs outside the projects. I think it's what inside the projects that counts. Well, we don't think they have anything to do with your affairs inside the projects right. in this respect. And it's nowhere in the uh, lease that says anything about them. Well, this is a rule that they have adopted. They have made it up themselves because a little slip of paper that they do give you, you know, to sign if you have one. I think I signed one in 50. I mean, 57, and I had only one child then. And um, it's just some typewritten thing. You know, nobody's signature or anything on the bottom. So that's not legal to me. The vice in this particular rule, and the reason why we think it's unconstitutional, is that the law is seeking to punish children. And the purpose of the federal housing laws is to protect the children and low-income families, punish children, for so-called immoral activity on the part of the parent. As you know, we're representing uh, several community organizations in Newark, New Jersey, who are opposing a project to place a medical college in the midst of a densely settled Negro area, uh, as the college is now planned. Uh, the college is planned to, or has been planned to occupy 150 acres uh, in this area and to displace, uh, according to our estimates, over 10,000 people in a city which does not have adequate housing to replace the housing which is being taken and no plans to do so. Uh, the groups we represent further object to the fact that the health facilities to be provided by the college do not relate to the health needs of the community. but. Rather, there is an intention to develop a teaching hospital which will take a small number of interesting uh, teaching cases. A person with an interesting kidney problem, interesting liver problem, uh, but not responsive to the health needs of that particular community. There's no objection uh, to plans to place a medical teaching facility in the area if it was designed to occupy a reasonable amount of land if there was a housing program that was prepared as to rehouse the people to be displaced and if the medical facilities to be provided related to the health needs of that community. Mike, didn't our city planner show in this case that um, the 160 acres would house the, what is it, the 20 largest medical schools in America? As the average medical college probably occupies no more than 10 to 15 acres. Well, the newest medical school, Mount Sinai, which is a first-rate school, occupies, I think, about a block and a half. This is a classic uh, Negro removal case where the effort is to uh, reduce the Negro population in the central ward of the city. This whole project just stinks to high heaven of political maneuvering because as you can see right here from our map, which is pretty much the bulk of the Central Ward, which is Newark's Black Belt, you have a medical school that's going to take up 150 acres of land. You have a highway coming through here, which is going to take uh, another large amount of acreage, not to mention the people that are going to be taken out. Now, just dwelling on the medical school per se, Newark is a city that has 60% black people or more. They say 52, but they don't count the missing black people. In 1970, there's a possibility that there may be a black mayor. So what they want to do, and what they will do if this thing goes through, is to displace thousands of voters from the rolls by 1970. Now, some of those people will just move out of town. Those that don't move out of town will go into other parts of the city. When it comes time to vote, if they are in fact registered, they will go to their old place of voting or they will go to a new place of voting and find that they are not eligible to vote there. This 
project is located in the midst of the riot area in Newark. Um, and many of the participants uh, in the organizations were directly affected and involved, uh, as everyone in that area had to be uh, in the riot. They're looking upon this effort really as their last attempt to present their grievances in an orderly um, manner. They've called upon the assistance of lawyers, of city planners, of architects. They've presented their grievances in a way in which I know no community to have done so. Uh, we have filed a complaint. There have been numerous conferences with federal, state, local authorities. If, if this considerable effort to present grievances in this manner fails, the community, I think, will become considerably dispirited, uh, and the very conditions which uh, we're attempting to, uh, to react to will merely be aggravated. Mike, let me interrupt you for a moment. You went up to Ossining yesterday to see, I think it was yesterday, to see about the road um, that's going to be built up there that's going to wipe out a Negro community. What is the status of that at the moment? That's an interesting comparison <coughs> to make to the Nashville situation. We, the road in, in Ossining is a Austin, road, New York. this is Ossining, New York, is a portion of the um, Hudson River Expressway, which passes by white communities and as it passes by white communities care has been taken to see to it that no houses are taken no businesses are affected as a matter of fact the state has been planning to fill in parts of the hudson river uh, to assure that there will be no damage to white interests but as it reaches austin which has a negro community the road was diverted inland again to pass through the negro community taking about a third of it in its path uh, we've got into this program in, in largest part because we've started uh, employing experts, uh, city planners and uh, people like that, who know how to go into a community and analyze it. And the lawyer goes in there, he really doesn't know what in the world's going on. And you don't, can't calculate relocation rates and uh, what is uh, proper land use and so forth. Uh, you're pretty much at sea. But now that we've been using experts, uh, we've had the capacity to do this. As I see it, the question is just what, what are we lawyers doing? What are we accomplishing? Well, you start in, you've, you, you've got the statutes of the United States, and you've got the Constitution of the United States, and you've got the decisions of the courts, and they kind of reach on down from, from Washington to uh, the states and the local government. Uh, but then there's this gap. How do you kind of take this and connect it up with the people? Now, traditionally, in our form of government, the way that's been done is either the public officials have obeyed the law on their own, uh, or somebody's gone to court and compelled them to obey it. Well, the essence of our problem is that they have not obeyed the law on their own. Uh, the Constitution uh, has required that uh, there not be segregation, but people nevertheless segregate. Uh, the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 says... Uh, uh, labor unions and uh, businesses, cantations can't discriminate, but they do. Um, hospitals can't discriminate, they do. Uh, well, how do you bridge this gap? Uh, the way it's been done, indeed the only way it can be done, is that some lawyer goes into court and hands a piece of paper in and starts the machinery rolling. He invokes the law and he brings out the facts uh, and if the courts do their duty, as traditionally they have, uh, then an order comes out and says that you may not segregate in the jury and you may not uh, discriminate in the Philip Morris Company and you, you can't discriminate in the hospital and you, you can't keep Negroes out of the hamburger stand uh, and you can't segregate in the school uh, and so forth. All these things we've been talking about. Unless a lawyer does it, it doesn't get done. We shall overcome. We shall overcome.